Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, sorry, I'm rather old school in that way. Um, it's great to be here at the STB conference, and thank you, William, for inviting me. Um, the array of speakers here come as fresh water to anyone who's struggled through the desert, which has been the Tory party conference this week. Um, did any of you watch it? Um, well, sometimes it did feel rather as though one was intruding on uh, private grief. Uh, either that, or one was peeping through a curtain into an alternate universe. This universe was one which seemed to be not concerned with an increasing sense of law and order breaking down. It was a universe in which statues weren't toppled and police did not turn up on people's doorsteps because of something written on social media. It was a universe which didn't appear to comprehend the extent of the political transformation of our institutions. Indeed, it was a universe which appeared not to take seriously the threat to the very foundations of our nation and indeed, I believe, our civilization. The absence of any sense of urgency surrounding all these issues would seem to be something of a drawback for a party which calls itself conservative. Instead, in the PM speech, we saw the dominance of a market conquers all fundamentalism. Now, watching this, a passage written by Evelyn War sprang to mind. In his novel, Brides Have Revisited, I'm sure many of you know it, he describes the character of the rather brash financier Rex Mottram, who's just joined the Marchmain family, a family, for better or worse, which is steeped in its own foibles and sense of tradition. Wrote War, quote, He wasn't a complete human being at all. He was a tiny bit of one, unnaturally developed. But he was something absolutely modern and up-to-date, and only something which this age could produce, a tiny bit of a man pretending he was the whole. Now, you don't have to share War's nostalgia to see the analogy I'm making, nor, indeed, fail to understand the dire economic straits we find ourselves in. You don't have to ignore those to appreciate how the whole of this country, just like a body or a person, now appears to be treated as merely a balance sheet or an international landing strip. Nothing has illustrated this more clearly than the recent announcement that to encourage growth, 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 such immigration rules as there are will be further loosened. Now this, at a time of already unprecedented levels of migration, displays a level of dismissiveness and neglect which amount to madness. It shows a complete disregard or even an incomprehension that such historical levels of migration have cultural as well as economic consequences. Cultural issues are tossed aside by a myopic political class which either doesn't understand them or remains unwilling to take them seriously. Instead, we have to tolerate an obsession with tax cuts and small states. But to borrow Oscar Wilde's definition of cynicism, they know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Uh, we at the New Culture Forum uh, are concerned with cultural issues because they are the most important of our time. Uh, when I founded the NCF in 2006, uh, I believed then that politics were indeed uh, upstream um, of culture, and I believe it now. I believe that, contrary to what many people think, people vote not purely out of economic interest, but also from a genuine concern for the future of their country as expressed in issues that are not necessarily economically quantifiable. They care about our institutions. They care about our culture. They care about our history. And the, uh, they understand clearly the motives of those who wish 
to denigrate and debase these things. They understand it far more clearly than the political and media class, which is prone to a herd-like adherence to intellectual fashion. Now, sooner or later, the Tory party might wake up on this, or it might be forced to by way of a huge electoral defeat, which is looking increasingly likely. Or indeed, it might not wake up. But those who seek to govern us, whoever they are, cannot, must not, continue to avoid or ignore the attack on our culture, history, and indeed, our very sense of ourselves as a nation. For that to happen, though, they need to acknowledge the extent of the problems. The fact that our institutions have been captured wholly by the left. The fact that a woke ideology of the sort so beautifully described by Joanna there, which books no opposition, dominates all areas of public life, from the police to our schools, from our museums to the civil service. The fact, too, that our history is being deconstructed and delegitimized before our very eyes. The fact that free speech is increasingly restricted by so-called hate speech legislation and a creeping, unofficial blasphemy law. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there is so much that can be done if the political will is there. I'd like to share with you some suggestions of my own. I say that all institutions which stray from their remit by prioritizing ideology should be challenged and, if necessary, lose any public funding they receive. There must be an end to talk of a bonfire of the quangos, and instead we must see action. These bodies, which instead of promoting Britain and caring for its history and heritage, actively undermine it, should be abolished. The entrenched heads of so many quangos should be fired and new, more sympathetic appointments made. It's really not difficult. The government must show it has guts once more rather than to continue to tolerate this massive, permanent, ideological opposition as though there is no alternative. There is. There should be a ban on the teaching, as though it were fact, of critical race theory and gender ideology in our schools. <laughs> the indoctrination, and that's what it is, the indoctrination of our children must end. It must be stated unequivocally that there is no blasphemy law in this country and that we will never ever again tolerate a situation where a teacher has to go into hiding for showing his pupils cartoons as happened recently in Baton. <laughs> Politicians are, as we all know, short-term merchants, so it might be hard for them to grasp that these issues have been taking root for years now, indeed decades, and that equally it will take a government with a longer, broader perspective to fight back. But fight back they must. For anybody who loves this country, its history and its culture like I do, and I'm sure you do, this is reaching, I believe, a critical point. In the meantime, it's up to people like us not to give up and not to despair. Things can and do change. Whatever your view, nobody would have believed that just 10 years ago, well, nobody would have believed 10 years ago that one day Britain would leave the EU. But it happened. Likewise, I believe that the cultural assault which we are currently seeing will eventually be overcome. It might take time, but it will happen. We must have faith. Recent elections in Europe have shown us there are undoubtedly winds of change happening across the continent. 
Public concern about large-scale migration certainly featured heavily in these elections. But here, in Britain, the received wisdom was that the public no longer really cared so much about immigration. We had, after all, taken back control. But government deception on immigration has been going on this whole past period. A record number of visas were issued last year, over a million. And a record number of illegal immigrants have continued to cross the channel, with the government offering stunts, which we all know have very little hope of taking any real effect. Now, the government is now building on this deception, and it represents the abandonment of even the pretense that we should instead train and equip our own people. They are, be they are being treated as being beside the point, effectively thrown on the scrap heap. The cultural effects, too, of mass migration can also be seen all around us. To take very recent examples, imported sectarian violence has been scarring the streets of Leicester. Clashes based on imported political issues have also led to violence in London. Such incidents have happened before, and they will certainly happen again in the future. Yet, anyone who demurs from the official narrative that immigration is an untrammeled good and that diversity is the main source of our strength faces ostracism, insult, and charges of racism. Lobbyists for migration, whose motives are never questioned by the media, have successfully managed to blur the crucial distinction between the moderate levels of immigration allowed by any normal country and mass migration of the type Britain has experienced over the past 20 years. British people, British people, I believe, are reasonable and they can easily make such a distinction. But they are not listened to. Indeed, they are actively ignored. Now, my own belief is that the situation is reaching such a point that the only answer is to have a moratorium on immigration. Such a pause would allow us to catch our breath, to assess where we are and put in place the border control which people thought they were voting for in 2016, and indeed which most people have always wanted. To, to those who say that such an idea is unreasonable, I would say that for years the British people have been treated, have not been treated reasonably by those who have instead ignored and demonized them. Now I know that the SDP has a robust policy on migration, which it proposes should indeed take place over a generation. I admire the courage of the SDP in being the only party right now to take such a position. And by way of finishing, I will say to you, ladies and gentlemen, and to William, that this amounts to a, a huge opportunity for you. Any attempt to seriously confront not just the issue of mass migration, but the wholesale hollowing out of this great country will be met with a ferociousness which will make Brexit look tame. But it will be worth it. And the future of our country depends on it. Thank you.